nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, so my full name is Attila Özgür Çakmak. I'm an assistant teaching professor at Penn State, and I'm very happy to be with you here today, even though we have started with a technological related delay. I'm sorry about that. So I hope we'll make up for it. So there's quite a bit of content here as we're covering several methods for in, uh, in total. Uh, but uh, so I will only show or highlight the important points. The slides might have more details and uh, you can go over them if you want. And please uh, keep in mind that we are preparing these materials for you to not just uh learn about it but also for you to teach them adapt them to your classes after you carefully of course we uh, know that you filter out the materials and use the ones that you like okay so here's the outline the important thing to remember we'll be starting with scm scanning electron microscope we'll be going over eds uh and uh energy dispersive spectroscopy so then we'll be going into electron probe microanalysis and then electron backscatter diffraction. So we have a huge package to cover. First, why are we really bothering ourselves with uh, nano characterization or why are we not just stuck with uh, optical microscopy in the first place? Well, this is our, the one on the left is of course our good old uh, optical microscopy, right? So that's uh, something we're all familiar with. Uh, and we use our eyes, we look through the eyepiece there, we use our eyes as the, uh, the detectors. And uh, what we do is basically we send the light down and then uh, the, we get the reflection from the particles down there. And then we take it through the lenses and then we get it on the top of the uh, uh, a camera or something to create the say bright field, dark field. So these are the special names we label based on whether we use diffraction or just look at the particles we are trying to analyze. But at the end of the day, we're kind of stuck with this uh, wavelength range that we call the optical spectrum. It's shown on the right hand side here. And uh, we that's where our eyes can see uh, from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Let me try to activate my so annotation tool. So this is what I'm talking about, as you can see here. So uh, unfortunately, we are only stuck with our eyes 400 nanometer and then roughly to 700 nanometers. And whatever we collect from the particles here that's going to go from the field, uh, the, the lenses will be created as an image. But this is coming with a, uh, a, a problem because now you can see that the smallest thing that we can resolve that we label here as D here is basically related to the lambda. That's the wavelength that we're working with. That's the optical spectrum wavelength. So this NA is numerical aperture, but you don't really necessarily have to worry about that if you're not familiar with it. It just has to do with the, the sizes of the, the optical lenses here. All right, so uh, we get our image and we, in the end, we're stuck with the wavelength like we were saying, and the shortest wavelength that our eyes can see is unfortunately 400 nanometers and lambda is reserved for the wavelength. So in Greek, that's a Greek letter. And uh, NA was the numerical aperture, like I was saying, and has to do with the physical size of the lenses. The biggest number that you can have for NA is one. So let's plug in our numbers. 400 nanometer is the smallest number, the lambda, the wavelength that we're working with, that we're getting the information from the particles. 400 over two divided by one. That's the best, uh, highest numerical aperture, like I was saying. So the D theoretically comes down to 200 nanometer. That tells us something. We can't really uh, analyze objects or resolve features that are smaller than 200 nanometers. So we're kind of stuck. We can't go beyond that. And believe in me, even 200 nanometers is very, very ambitious for optical microscopy. So we have to play still with this equation. The straightforward thing that tells us is, well, I have to rescale this lambda, right? So I can't work with 400 nanometers. I have to do something. I have to switch from the realm of photons, the light. I have to switch to electrons. So that, there you go. Electrons come into play. This new physics gives us the luxury to scale down the wavelength drastically. Okay, 
So before going into the realm of electrons, so I, I mean, if I didn't know elect, uh, quantum mechanics, of course I would be shocked because you're sending electrons and you're talking about uh, as electrons as being uh, particles, uh, uh, we're talking about the wavelength of electrons. Yes, quantum mechanics 101 in a nutshell says that these quantum particles are actually both particles and also waves. That's the Weber-Oglis uh, law that was figured out in the early 20th century at the uh, uh, down of quantum mechanics. So they are sending these quantum particles, as you can see, into the slit experiment. And it kind of uh, acts like a interference pattern, like you can see. So we got like a wave phenomenon at the end. So if we send enough number of particles, you get to see these fringes. And this is like done with neutrons. Uh, like you can see, that's a really wave phenomenon at the end of the slit experiment. So what I'm saying is quantum particles and electrons, they have a wavelength and that we showed as lambda, like we were saying. And it's related to their momentum that's shown with P. So these are like just a couple of equations that I will bother you with. I won't really show you a lot of uh, equations. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. That's not the main idea, but uh, they're tied, the, the momentum. If you like to think about momentum, Let's say it's the same classical momentum. This has to do with the speed. So if the uh, electron has certain speed, it's tied up over this Planck constant. Planck is another very important name in quantum mechanics. So if you like to find lambda, that's the wavelength, they're tied up to each other. And we also know that just like the same, uh, photons uh, also kind of act like they have a momentum, which means that they act like, uh, uh, surprisingly act like they have a uh, uh, particle nature. So that's why I put this little cartoon here. It's like a, uh, quite a, a um, concerned and uh, surprised, but also not quite certain photon about uh, the existential crisis that's, that's going through. So the bottom line is, if we can speed up, if we can give these electrons some momentum, we will be able to play with their wavelength. So that's great because if you go back to our formula, now we're going to be able to switch to a very short wavelength. Let's give you some numbers. If we speed these electrons to 10 kilo electron volts, okay, with certain voltage applied, right? Because these are charged particles. And if we apply a certain plus negative voltage, we can speed them up. Then the wavelength scales down to 12.3 picometers. Let's remember where we were stuck. We were stuck around 400 nanometers. Now we switch down to picometers. That's a gain of 1,000 times if we were to think about it, because we started with 10 to the minus 9. Now we're in the realm of 10 to the minus 12. Great. So if we can even speed it up to 200 with 200 kilo electron volt, uh, I mean, if you give that kind of an energy to the electron, so they even go smaller than that. It, scales down to 2.5. And just to give you an idea, 50 million electrons, they're hitting the sample at every second. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, let's give you a little bit of history. I tried to create a history slide, but it didn't fit into my slide, like you can see. That's not a really very surprising thing because uh, electron microscope is a very well known, very well investigated thing. It kind of emerged in the, the main ideas, the first, uh, Electron microscope came with uh, the contributions of Max Knoll and Ernst Roska uh, in 1930s, early and late 1920s. They built the first microscope, uh, I mean, the electron microscope. It was a TEM, transmission electron microscope, and we're going to cover that in the full semester as another characterization method. And it's still emerging, like you guys can see, Roska, and they get, got the Nobel Prize in the 80s. All right, this picture is showing you the similarities that we have in the main uh, architecture. So you see here an optical microscope, and this is what I will be introducing today. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with this, an electron microscope, right? So this idea is the same. We have a, like a column structure, and we have like certain lenses, something to guide the wave, the beam. In this case, it was light. In this case, it's an electron beam. The idea is to focus down the beam and then get something to the detector side so we can detect, we can analyze what's going on, okay? 
So I'll be sitting in front of this electron microscope, uh, scanning electron microscope, specifically a, a field emission uh, scanning electron microscope. And I'll be controlling things using this keyboard here with this joystick. And I will be uh, watching through what's happening over these two monitors. And I'll be placing my samples. I already placed them inside this little chamber here. All right, now we're gonna discuss the scanning electron microscope together. All right, so at first glance, I know if you were not, if, you, if this is the first time you're seeing this, it might be frightening uh, because there's lots of things going on here, lots of compartments, etc. But we're gonna divide and concur, okay? So a lot of things will be much more clear, I hope, towards the end. So, but at the, there's a chat thing coming up. So if you can interrupt, that will be better. Uh, for me, because I can't efficiently switch between my laser and uh, look at the the chat. Where did the chat go? I, I just said it's awesome. Yes. <laughs> it's not scary. It's awesome. Okay. Sorry. Great, great, great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I'm very happy that you like the picture. So um, one thing is we're going to be looking into topographical information. So we're going to look at the, the, the features on the, on the surface. We're going to look into chemistry and composition too. So this is something that we're now introducing with nanocharacterization. What I mean is normally when we see under an optical microscope, we kind of just get a top view, right? So like a bird's eye view. Now we're going to investigate it some in terms of more like understanding it uh, it's uh, uh, little uh, counterparts. It's what it's made out of. We'll try to understand the chemistry and the composition. So by the way, I'd like to also emphasize that there's all these things are taking place in vacuum, but I'm like kind of putting a an asterisk there because I'm going to also show you some new features where we may not need the vacuum at all. All right, so these are TOR. So TOR, as you know, is the unit of uh, pressure, of course. Okay, so, but first, we're gonna produce an electron beam, right? That's how we will investigate the sample that we put here. And the, all these E's are representing the electron and everything is coming from top. So we, we will need, uh, we'll start with an electron gun, okay? An electron source, just like the light source for the uh, optical microscope. How are we gonna get the electron uh, beam? We'll need something that will be full of electrons. What comes to our minds? Well, metals. Metals are conductive and they're very rich with electrons. So we will try to release electrons from the metals. Okay, so there are two main ways to do that. One of them, the first one is thermionic emission. And thermionic emission is basically has to do with the name therm, right? So we are giving some heat to the metal and we are extracting electrons from the metal. The second one is field effect. In this case, we're applying some field and extracting electrons again. So I'll show this in more detail in this slide here. In this first one, in this first two uh, here on the left-hand side, we have a thermionic emission, meaning that if you put a filament like this, as simple as that, okay, and run some current, heat it up, and then that heat will make sure that your electron will be able to set free because you're now giving uh, heat to the, uh, or energy to the electrons that are bound to the tungsten material, you can set them free. Likewise, you can get it free from this more decent tip. That's what we will call it, electron beam gun. Uh, that's called lab six. And it's a better uh, candidate than the tungsten material. It stays, its lifetime is better its uh, resolution is slightly better too, its brightness is also. But on the other hand, that's all about heat. If we apply some external field, what kind of a field am I talking about? An electric field. We can also extract electrons from the material, this sharp material that we will etch and sculpture specifically. Why are we doing this? This is kind of like, you can think of it that way, uh, like we're going to be playing Benjamin Franklin. We're going to go the, uh, to the uh, thunderstorm and uh, we're going to try to get some lightning towards us. So, uh, you know, we're going to get the, the field uh, on top of the this lightning rod. And that's really what is called the lightning rod effect. And we're going to try to 
get the electrons thanks to the amplified electric field towards the edge. Okay, it's good. These two are really good candidates, good phenomena. One of them is the heat. The other is the field, like I was saying. That's, the, that's what's uh, making the work. Like you can see here, if you apply some external fields, these are showing you the field coming from these anode. Anode represents plus. So there's some uh, voltage applied here to extract the, the electrons that are coming from the tip. And we are also uh, suppressing some uh, electron emission from the other parts. Like So this, this cage here is uh, uh, serving that purpose by applying the right negative voltage. But these two are good. These two phenomena are good. But they said, why don't we just combine the two effects? So why don't we create a tip that's making uh, use of both of these worlds? So we're going to heat up the material that's shown here. This is the uh, uh, Schottky uh, type uh, uh, emission. So this is again field emission. Uh, we're going to apply field as well, but we're going to apply heat too. So combining the two with a zirconium oxide reservoir on this tip here, we're going to melt the zirconium oxide. And then as long as we have some zirconium oxide, this is going to create this uh, Schottky emission and this is kind of showing you more physics, how this whole thing is managed. Normally, an electron is sitting on this level, this energy level here, okay? So you can think of this, my laser pointer is like an electron. It sees all these barriers to tackle. It can't get free because it has to go over. If we give them a heat energy, so it can get released. So that's a thermionic emission, but it's still a lot of uh, uh, energy that you can see here. If we give the external field, it can do what we call quantum tunneling effect. And that's shown here with the field emission. So you're tunneling through. But this is a cold type tip. So we're not applying heat to this one. In the mid, uh, taking good advantage of both of the worlds, we're applying heat. So we're reducing um, or we're giving the electron the external heat, the energy. but with the applied field too, we're able to bend this, this barrier, if you like to think of it that way. I'm not going into the detailed physics of it, but with the applied field, external field, that's electric field here, we're able to bend this barrier here. So we're giving electron more chance to go over this barrier. That's the whole idea to create the, uh, the beam in the end. The main idea at, at the end, so all those tungsten thermionic emission, lap six thermionic emission, cold type field emission, and Schottky type field emission, they're all listed, the, uh, the details, the, the characteristics. The main idea is this one, brightness. So if you're gonna go for a tip, this is what you would like to uh, take notice. Of course, you can't just replace a tungsten uh, a filament with a Schottky type tip. It's uh, because the, these two tools would be probably uh, uh, are di very different tools in the end too. So, but uh, these are the thermionic emission are more uh, easily found scanning electron microscopes, simple, uh, relatively simpler scanning electron microscopes. Uh, and these are uh, FESCM's field emission type scanning electron microscopes. Okay, as you can see, the brightness really outweighs the thermionic emission when we apply the field emission. Then you will say, oh, look at the cold type without the heat application. I have the highest brightness. Why are they not using this? The problem is when you don't have heat involved, like in this kind of a tip, when you don't have heat, all the external particles will go and condense on the surface and you can't release them out. So all of a sudden your tungsten uh, tip will be covered with all this uh, adhered, adsorbed material on the surface. And that's gonna be really bad because you're gonna stop uh, extraction. You're gonna stop the, the beam uh, and you're, you're gonna lose the resolution in yes. So you have to flash them out. So you, you will have to uh, heat it up basically from 25 to some higher temperature to release those uh, adsorb particles. So that's not really ideal. So you have to stop the, uh, the, the uh, operation and then restart it again next day or so. But with this shot key, you don't have to do that. You can reliably run it over the time and then uh, get the brightness. 
get the lifetime, get uh, get all the performance you like. And uh, the resolution is very similar to each other, these two as well. Okay, the brightness. What is this brightness all about? So there's another formula here, but just follow me. The main idea is the following. So let's say that we start to create our beam with this kind of a spot diameter. If it's spot diameter, the beam that we will generate from these any one of these tips, if it's small, that's great because that means you will get a better resolution. You like to minimize your spot diameter as much as possible. So that's why this D is in the downstairs here. It's uh, inversely proportional to your brightness beta. And if your convergence angle is again large, that's also coming as a bad factor. If your beam current, that's the the number of has to do with the number of electrons that you're sending, that's of course proportional to your brightness as you can expect. But brightness and beam current are not directly proportional because otherwise the thermionic emission could also get a would be doing really good too. So because they have a huge beam current. But it, their uh, convergence and spot diameter are terrible comparatively. So that's why they're not really commonly used when it comes to really high resolution. I mean, better resolution, improved resolution. OK, so great. Let's say we're now sticking to the field emission. We got our tip here that you can see. And this is the whole column that we are going to cover. We're just now concerned about this, this, this end here. That's the uh, electron beam generation part. And we have this tip here. We're trying to extract the electrons with this help of these extractors, the positive uh, voltages that we're applying. And then we're getting the electrons, the instant beam. There is one thing here that I would like you to pay attention to. If we accelerate the beam, that's that means the if we accelerate the electrons, the beam energy is increasing. You see that the spot diameter, the 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 spots that's the the beam spot that we're initially generating is dropping down drastically. So that's that means one thing. If I will need to work with higher energy electrons in this, uh, if I would like to get a better resolution, most likely. So they're correlated. So if I have a good uh, spot diameter, I know it's switched to a different convention, RP. Sorry about that. But that means this little diameter here that's generated from the tip. So if I start with a good spot diameter, then I will get a good uh, better resolution most likely too. Now you're seeing here the tip in, in, uh, in it's uh, like we took it out from our SEM here, the zirconium oxide tungsten tip here uh, with the suppressor that I was talking about. The tip is here. And these are some general numbers about comparison between SEM and FESEM. The numbers are here like SEM, you can purchase it on the scale of tens of thousands of dollars. Well, whereas FESCM field emission is like hundred thousand dollars at least, and but the, that comes with a good spot size that we will see here at the end. That has to do with the resolution. Now, this spot size is the spot size of the beam that we will have on the top of the surface of our uh, uh, sample. So it's going to be lower than two nanometers. This means we will have a better resolution than two nanometers. Okay, we'll be able to resolve beyond two nanometers. And you, you can see the resolution curves here too with the field emission cathode. And we, if we increase the acceleration voltage, that's one remedy that I just pronounced so far. If we increase the beam energy, we'll get a better resolution. So you can see, I mean, in, in terms of the just the beam formation, so we'll get a thinner beam. That's what I mean, okay? So the tungsten and the lab six are not doing as good as the field emission. Now, what do we do in the next phase? We'll have to guide these electrons. We'll have to make sure that they go to the, uh, the sample. Guiding them, guiding and bending and deflecting or focusing in general has to do with the lenses, like the optical microscope. And this is just showing you how it works with an external magnet on a CRT old tube. That there's also electron emission here. So how does it work? Simply like that. You have a magnet here. And when the charged particles are going through the magnet, just like our optical, uh, optical lenses, this magnet will be able to uh, uh, focus the electron beam too. So uh, that's great, uh, but it's a, I mean, don't think that it's gonna do a great job when in terms of the refraction phenomena that it's enabled, it's a much poorer quality, much poorer performance compared to the optics. 
And this is a simulation that I carry out with my graduate students here. So you're seeing like a, this is a an electron beam coming into a lens. This is a magnetic lens. And uh, this is the result of uh, lots of lots of electrons. Their trajectories are calculated. And we have a coil here. And the coil creates, of course, a magnetic field, an external magnetic field for us to focus the beam. But of course, if we don't, if we just let it go out like that, it's going to diverge. I put it here because I would like you to pay attention to one thing. Let's say that I am an electron going in the middle, right? I'll be able to nicely focus somewhere here. But I'm an electron that's like closer to the magnet on the side. I'll be able to focus a little late. It, uh, it's a different point. And in the end, when I diverge, I will end up in different points. So my focal point will not be just a single spot. That's what I mean, OK? So this is a real life uh the demonstration of what's going to be waiting ahead of us that's what we call an aberration problem because we're not just talking about a singular focal point but depending on two two main things here that i'm showing the spherical uh, aberration and the other one is called chromatic aberration we'll be focusing the beam at different spots that's terrible they're not ideal not something we really like but say uh, in the spherical case, this really has to do with where I interact with the uh, the lens, the electromagnetic lens. Even though I'm showing it like the regular lens, it's always the electromagnetic lens, of course. The 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 electron uh, that's going to be coming away from the magnets will be less effective, and thereby we will be focusing it like here. The electron that's like interacting more and uh, we're creating more force applied, so we'll be refracting earlier, so we'll be creating an earlier focal point. So it all depends on where the electron and the, the magnetic field interacts, right? So it's tied up to classical uh, electromagnetic uh, equations. Simply, you can uh, solve it, uh, Lorentz law. Um, and then if you have different energies, so the electron comes in and then interacts, but this time the electron has different energies. You see like E0 or E0 minus delta E, like a slightly lower. They will also be focused at different points too. This is again showing you this chromatic aberration, not a single focal point is present. And this is also showing you one more time here, the electrons, two types of electrons are coming in and entering at different points, spherical aberration one more time. The focal point is not really well defined so instead of that we define this what we call important thing disk of minimal confusion bc so this is kind of like the minimal area where okay I'm, you can like say okay this is the kind of my focal point vaguely uh, but again quotation marks on the point part because based on where i enter the the magnet and interact with the magnet of course my deflection my refraction phenomena will be different all right, now, with these electromagnetic lenses, we've got other problems too. Let's look at these two cases where I have on the right a strong condenser lens. And on the left-hand side, I have a weak lens. A weak lens will have a smaller magnification. So let's say that this is my beam current, okay? So this is my beam that's coming in this much. And I did not... Uh, 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 use a lot of magnification. So that means it's a weak lens, right? So in our daily life, we also say like if, we, if, a, if, if a lens doesn't have a high magnification constant or if it doesn't uh, 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 magnify a lot, so we kind of like say, okay, it's not, a, uh, it's not a very strong lens, right? So in a similar fashion, now we kind of uh, focused it and then we created the image but it's not uh, it's quite quite close to the initial one so we kind of uh, allow a lot of beam current passing through that's what i mean so we started with a lot of beam current and quite a bit of a lot of beam current still go through and then it comes down to the sample so this is the sample side so on the sample i have a large beam current how do i know that because i have a large radius of the beam the beam and the beam current are proportional to each other and wherever I say be high beam current, I mean a large radius of the beam as well. On this side, I have the other phenomena. I see that I have a, a, a strong condenser lens that can uh, uh, um, 
uh, uh, that has a better magnification and make my image much smaller, right? And then can uh, also focus on my sample in a much better fashion. So see, I was able to narrow down my beam a lot. But while I'm doing that, I'm actually losing a lot of my beam too, because all this thing is, has been handled with the pupils of these uh, uh, lenses. What I mean is they actually have the, their own apertures. They filter out quite a bit of the, the current that we're sending. So we're sending this much of current. We are able to narrow it down to here with the strong lens, but what, what's the rest gonna go? It's gone to a uh, trash bin. We just lost it. So good side, we get a good resolution because we, our beam is nicely focused. But that side is I'm losing, that means I'm losing a lot of current at the same time. Here, uh, I'm not losing a lot of current, but the, the beam is really large, so that's also bad. So I'm not gonna get a good resolution. So you see, a large beam probe will yield high signals because you have a high, high beam current that's hitting your sample, but it's gonna give you low resolution. And vice versa is true for this case here. And on just on top of it, we've got other problems here. The magnets that we're using inside will not uh, will be demagnetized and will not go back to their uh, original uh, spot. What I mean is, while we're trying to focus it, and I was showing you the two dimensional pictures, we're not going to be able to focus both on the X and the Y at the same time. So what I'm saying is, we'll not get these nice circles will get more like these kind of ellipses. Because while I'm trying to focus, let's say on X, you see X is small. The uh, diverge, I mean, the, the variance is small, but Y is really large. So I'm not able to focus good on the Y. So in order to counteract that, I need to put external things, that's the stigmator, to counteract those kind of problems. And I will be showing you, I'll be using them when I sit in front of the SEM to be able to get nice beam again and focus both on the X and the Y in a two dimensional fashion and a real life problem at the same time. Another important thing to remind you is the definition of working distance. The working distance is the physical distance between the, uh, the, uh, the uh, objective lens, the last point of the objective lens and your sample. That's shown with WD. That's a very, very important uh, uh, abbreviation. You see that at the focal point, I have the smallest uh, point, the spot that I can create with the beam. That's my focal point. If I go to a different working distance, if I go just slightly up, what's going to happen? We know it from our daily life. It's going to just be blurry because the beam spot is gonna be a little blurred out. It's just gonna expand, right? Just following the beam a little bit up. It goes in this uh, other direction too. This thing, this thing is cold. Still, we're able to define a pixel here. You see, we're able to still withstand, like uh, able to focus within here. That is what we call depth of field or depth of focus, okay? Two very important definitions. This was working distance, and now I just define depth of focus. If you go beyond that point, if you go even further, you see that I get a really lousy beam. I can't focus. I can't define a nice pixel. It's really totally out of focus. So that's out of my depth of focus. I don't have the right depth of focus for this problem. That's what we say. So look at the depth of focus here. It's a wonderful example. Why? Because I can see the things, that's a better way of putting what depth of focus is. I can see things here clearly, but I can also see things like downside here also quite clearly too. So that means I have a really like a high depth of focus. I'm not sure how they got this, but it's really a great image. So shortly, uh, this, this thing actually shows you the final thing about the, how these all are related working distance, the definition, let's remember working distance. I told you that's the distance, the physical distance between the objective lens and the sample. So that's W1 here. This is W2 here. Which one has a larger working distance? This one here on the right. It's further away from the objective lens. That means that my resolution will be poor because, I mean, that's trivial, I hope, because 
the if we go uh, further away from the objective lens right so we're going to lose the resolution the sample will be further away if we go to the extreme if we go to the infinite we won't be able to resolve it this is a smaller working distance but at the cost of what let's look at it the lens has nicely focused it to the sample but once the beam uh, goes out of the focal point it expands very very uh, quickly if it expands very quickly that means we have a very poor depth of focus so shortly working distance and depth of focus are proportional to each other if we have a large working distance the exiting focused beam will be uh, diverging not that quickly this angle here this alpha 2 is small but if we have a small working distance our resolution might be good but we will have a really bad depth of focus because our beam is uh, diverging very very quickly this alpha 2 angle is very large okay so we talked about the aberration problem how can we combat the aberration problem let's remind ourselves the aberration problem one more time like these two electrons coming into the electron beam at different points like this red one and the purple one what's the easiest solution to make sure that you will be tackling this aberration problem well if you don't have these purple electrons then you're good what does it mean if i have an aperture and if i make sure that i block some of the electrons that are going to be hitting the wrong spots but if i only allow the correct uh, electrons that are within the range of energy or within the range of the coordinate system then that's great that's going to be combating my aberration problem but this comes with a problem to itself because uh we have a huge optical system here elect uh, electromagnetic optics but still an optical system if things what are the things the electron beam uh, generator lenses and the apertures if they are not nicely aligned this is a nice alignment along the optical axis that's what we call it this is great uh, but if they're not nicely aligned we will have this common problem that we call aperture misalignment you see the beam that's going to the sample is not the one that's nicely aligned so what will happen is if you follow this focal point okay i'm following it if i focus to this point for example my image will be shifting to the right so you see if i follow it to the up if i play with my focal point my working distance this image will be shifting to the right so that's what we will see on our screen the image will be starting to wobble it's going to go to the right axis because we're going to be shifting to the right axis here it doesn't work like that if we move up since things are nicely aligned my image will be stationary it's just gonna get blurry but it's just stationary it's just gonna get expanded but it's not gonna it's just gonna stay and twinkle okay more coming on we really covered quite a lot like the lenses the apertures but how does the beam know where to go on the sample that's thanks to the scan coils you've got a stage here that holds the samples but actually we need the some sort of scan coils to make sure that we send the electrons to the right spot we can't just rely on some mechanical scanning tool because we like to make sure we know where we are going to scan so that's where the s comes from scanning electron microscope so we're going to pixel out the area that we're going to examine and we're going to create our little pixels and that's going to be our magnification I'll show it better, but if you, of course, if you scan a smaller area, you'll get a better resolution. I hope that's obvious. We'll get a better resolution like shown here because our pixel size will be smaller too. This is how the scanning electron microscope will work. We're going to scan from left to right every time, line by line. So we will send the beam to this spot and then we'll scan in, uh, along this line, go to the next line and then goes on like that. All right. So the magnification is obviously this ratio the the exact uh, size that you see on your monitor versus the specimen the actual physical size that's going to be your magnification number your magnification will be determined by another thing of course that we just covered the working distance 
look at the two cases, the working distance. This is now the edge here. Now we're, we are working distance, the physical distance between the objective lens and the, uh, the sample is only this much. And in here it's wider. So my uh, magnification is higher here because I'm able to scan a smaller area. A smaller physical object is being scanned in here in contrast to this. All in all, I'm trying to pixel out things and I'm trying to uh, fine tune my pixel size and put my uh, 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 spot in the correct uh, area on the pixel side. Why? Because if I don't put my electron beam to this nice pixel, but if I create a lousy electron beam and get the whole information from these pixels, the background is still the mustache, Mario's mustache, Originally, Mario's mustache should give me the black color. But if I put my electron beam and try to get the pixel information from all these uh, neighborhoods, it's going to just average things out and not give me the correct color. It's going to just give me grayish color, not the, not the correct one that I'm looking for. So it's going to smooth things out, but that's not right. Luckily, I also have some noise reduction tools within the system. So I will show you we will have this chance of doing some line averaging, some frame averaging, et cetera, to reduce the image uh, noise. And we can scan it slower, faster, et cetera, so to get from here to there. This is going to be our stage. We're going to place our samples on the stage one by one, and then everything is going to be nicely sitting inside this chamber. And we're going to hit them with this electron B. After this interaction, now we're going to go into the uh, examination of sample interaction beam with the beam. Once we hit the electron uh, uh, beam with the uh, sample, the sample will release some things. All these things can be possible. We're going to look into them, not Auger electrons today, but uh, and catholuminescence too, but we're going to look into X-rays, backscattered, and secondary electrons together. Well, Ogier is just an extension. It's not really uh, another, like it's a different nanocharactization area, uh, but this is like the most uh, commonly used uh, probably the three SEM uh, the detectors that you will find, which I told you the secondary electrons, the backscattered electrons and the X-ray type characterization, which we will call the EDS. All right, so we come with the electron beam from the top. So coming back to this picture, the electrons that are gonna be generated within the sample will be coming from different positions with different energies. And we're gonna take a look at the reasons for that. The electrons that gonna come from the shallowest points, actually they're gonna be Auger, but if we disregard the Auger for the time being, they're going to be the secondary electrons. They have the lowest energy now we're going to be examining. So they're lower in, in energy. Look at the energy scale. This is the energy axis. And this is, you can think of it as the population. Their energy is low. And then if we go down into the depths, we get, we're going to get generate more backscattered. So what are these, of course? But let's look at them. So just keep in mind that they're coming from different positions in a way from the sample. Okay, so what are secondary electrons? Secondary electrons are going to be generated by hitting with the beam into the atoms of your sample, and we're going to knock off these orbital electrons, like this electron now has been released, and we just created what we call an uh, anti-electron and a hole in this uh, whole uh, uh, orbital system of the atom. And this new generated electron that's set free is called secondary electron. As you would expect, this doesn't have a lot of energy. This needs to go and go to the detector immediately. Otherwise, we'll lose our information. So summary, this is how we create it. And it doesn't have a lot of energy. It doesn't have a lot of energy. So it's what we call the escape depth is very shallow too. So the intensity of the electrons uh, while it's like, say, we hit the sample and then we're uh, starting to create these secondary electrons and they're shown with these uh, red uh, arrows. This poor one here at the bottom, it needs to really go outside of the sample very quickly. But look at it. 
if it stays more and more longer and longer inside, its intensity will be lost. It's going to lose its breath. So it's not going to go out. It's going to be trapped. It's not going to be escaping. What's the one remedy? Well, if you just tilt the sample a bit, you see the secondary electron uh, extraction is all about topography. So if you tilt it a bit, you have, will like get, uh, create more chances of extracting more electrons, at least from this side here, once the secondary electrons are generated. The secondary electron generation does not have to do a lot with the atomic number of your sample. So it doesn't know what your sample is. So whatever atomic number you have, just generate almost same amount, uh, except for, of course, uh, very low energy cases and very low atomic number situations. Those are exceptional scenarios. But that's how we, we're generating the secondary electrons. This is the first and very important and the one that we will also examine the type of uh, generation and the uh, uh, beam sample interaction. And this is what we call the edge effect that's coming from the secondary electron generation. We come with the beam. And then in this case, those electrons that are like down here are going to be trapped more than likely. Only those that are going to be going out. But if we're close to an abrupt edge like this here, am I kicked out? Can you hear, hear me? You're still good, Oscar. Okay. Yes. I just lost the cameras for some reason. Okay. So if we're like close to this um, abrupt edge, then these electrons that were more likely to be trapped will be going out too. So what does this mean? If we're really close to this kind of a geometry that is really thin and that that's like enabling my electrons to be released in the case of like this case here with the edges, then uh, our intensity will be really amplified and we will get more contrast from those. You see, they're really high brightness. They have high brightness. That means we're extracting a lot of electrons from those edges. That's what edge effect is essentially. But it, unlike the other place, so all in all, what I'm trying to emphasize is if you like to do, in summary, a topographical information gathering, you like to work with secondary electrons, okay? The rest is kind of more details. What, why? Because it, ha it gives you a lot of information about the escape depth, and that means you're really thinking about, like, the contrast is all about, like, the features that you have on the surface. Now, this was just, we covered, uh, it was an inelastic type of interaction. So we gave this uh, energy of the incoming electron and released this, okay, this new electron. So we lost the energy, incident energy. This is an inelastic kind, uh, sorry, elastic type of uh, uh, interaction. Our incident electron comes in and gets just pulled by the nucleus of the atom and then, then just deflect it somewhere and will be backscattered. So the original electron will be able to get out uh, of the sample, okay? These are really like highly energetic electrons under the influence of the, in, uh, the nucleus. They can be released back outside of the sample and that's what we will be trying to collect. They will have a lot of other information that can give us instead of the secondary electron, what type? Okay, now this is a great image showing you what we can extract. The backscattered electron release has to do with the atomic number. Why? Because if the nucleus is large, this action of deflection, this force of deflection will be better. So more and more electrons will be released. And you can see the two different images obtained by different uh, detection mechanisms. This was the secondary electron that we just covered. This is now the backscattered electrons that we're just introducing. In the secondary electron case, we have good topography. That's great. But we can't put a lot of information in terms of other, like, other than topography. In the backscattered electron, I can tell that, OK, so this nanowire, this cap, and underneath whatever that's made out of are made out of two different elements because the cap is giving me 
a lot of releasing me a lot of electrons back that means it must have a high atomic number contrast to the uh, the nanowire itself and that's really the truth that cap is made out of gold whereas the uh, nanowire is silicon so silicon is lower uh, atomic number all right so with this beam sample interaction of backscattered electrons people think that these are like ping pong balls you send them and they get released back so you immediately get the most at the normal incidence so you send it from the top and then you get it a lot at the normal incidence but this doesn't mean that backscattered electrons don't have information about the topography too if you start tilting the sample they also act differently they don't send you the information back the highest number of electrons so you see it's tiered towards this direction so this means it's sending the most amount of electrons in this direction. And if you tilt it even more, it sends it in this direction. So this shortly means if you have like this kind of a scenario with a surface, then your electrons will be received from different angles. If you have large angles coming from the surface with the backscattered electrons, that means you're having a lot of topographical information, just like scanning a secondary electrons detection. If you have the normal incidence that's more about the the compositional information about the atomic number all right now the beam detection we created the beam we guided the beam we, the beam started interacting with the sample all great but then we have to uh, collect that beam and make use of that beam so here in this case we get the incident beam the red colored beam coming in and we're starting the secondary electrons that we label here as SC1. As the electron propagates, it continues to create more secondary electrons. Look at them along its trajectory. But what is happening? If it's not created within this first shallow depth, all those secondary electrons, these poor guys, are trapped because they don't have enough energy to escape. Whereas the backscattered electron, this original electron, along its trajectory was able to go outside so it's had high energy okay so in this case while it's going out we have got a lot of other electron creation from this other edge too so that we will call secondary electron two number two we are analyzing this spot and we are getting electrons from this spot that's not a great uh, deal so if you like to get a good resolution, you like to get your electrons from this spot. So if it were me, I would love to choose just SC ones on top of the other ones. What are those? The red guy itself and also the SC2. These detectors, they're placed inside a chamber, just like the chamber that the sample is sitting inside and the objective lens and the gun column, everything that we're describing so far. It's like on the walls. That's the first uh, detector that I'm showing, the typical Everhard Thornley detector. And it's just, uh, let me show you. It just, when the sample interacts and releases the electrons, this scintillator uh, creates uh, photons, light out of this interaction, the incoming electrons. And the light is, with an optical waveguide, is sent to this photomultiplier which generates more current so it's amplified in general and then we get the uh, uh, the information but it requires high vacuum high vacuum needs to be taken place so you see we got all these different detectors that we can work with everhard is the first one that i introduced and like i was saying it works with the secondary electron so when the secondary electron is uh, released it goes in and turn into light but that's a that's not the great solution, greatest solution that I can come up with. Why? Because once I send my beam, like I said, this detector that is just sitting sitting inside the chamber can detect SE2, can detect uh, these backscattered electrons, BSE, can detect even SE3s. These are the ones that are generated with the interaction of the chamber walls. Terrible. So not the highest resolution. What else can you do? How can you just get the ones that you really, really, really want? Okay, so this is one way. This is called in-lens detection. Uh, well, uh, through the lens, I believe that's another way. 
through the lens detector, TLD. So this is our Eberhardt that's sitting inside the chamber, not the idealist, not the greatest one that you would like to work with. But if you have like this magical way to get the, sorry. Okay, so my alarm clock, okay. So if we can extract these electrons magically and get the ones that I just want, like SE ones, and leave the other ones alone, that will be great. How can I do that? Well, I can do that with the help of an external magnetic field, which is going to be guiding the, 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 the generated electrons nicely into this detector that we will work with too, in lens detector. And I will only get the SE ones and SE twos here in this time. Unfortunately, I'm also going to extract SE2s. I can't like uh, get rid of them easily. Now, what else can I do? I generated backscattered electrons. How about the backscattered electrons? Like I said, they're like ping pong balls. You send them, they were released back. So this works based on a, an, uh, a semiconductor type of a detector that just ex uh, accepts the incoming uh, electrons, backscattered electrons, and generates the current. Not a great deal, but then what happens is, like I was saying, these detectors are labeled with a certain angle, so they're expecting at different trajectories. But it's like a ping ball ball, so A is waiting just directly hit uh, returns, so like at almost normal incidence. D is like high angle. As we were saying, D will cover more about topography, where A will cover more about the composition. So if we look at the detection here, okay, this figure compared A and D. D coming from the outer shell for the large angle detection of the backscattered electrons just gives me the topographical information. In contrast, A is giving me more about the contrast between the inside the sample. So that means I'm getting more compositional information here immediately. Backscattered electrons are good because electron detection is good because they uh, suffer less from what we will call charging effect. I'll come back to this. I didn't cover it uh, explicitly yet, but it's a very famous phenomena and you encounter this charging effect. Well, we can even introduce it now because we are basically loading your sample with a lot of electrons, right? And a lot of them are not able to leave the sample, unfortunately. So you're charging up your sample with current. If that's the case, then you will end up with these charged zones, charged zones like uh, bleached out zones and dark zones. So they're terrible. But since backscattered electron is released from the depth and has high escape depth, they will not be suffering from this trap trapping mechanism that much. So you won't be dealing with a lot of charging effects. So that's why you can get better uh, images with uh, charged samples. I'll come back to that later on. Another one, a detection ESP, energy selective uh, backscattered electrons. So why don't you just again receive your backscattered electrons inside the lens again, so inside the column, and then you decelerate them like this you decelerate and you filter out the ones that are not high energy and only get the ones that are high energy. Why? Because those electrons that we just covered in a few slides ago, those secondary electrons are also making up here into the column. So if you make sure that those low energy electrons, those secondary electrons are filtered out. And if you're only working with the backscattered electrons, let's remember the uh, the prerequisite of being a backscattered electron is high energy. If you have high energy, then you have a pass, then you can detect it. Let's look at it. The inlens gets this kind of a topographical information. Good. Has some charging effect, I believe here, but has a lot of topographical information. When I switch to backscattered electron detection again, with a grid of a slowing fa down factor, which means that I'm filtering out those secondary electrons, I'm getting a great compositional information that gives me the contrast. Again, the charging effects. What is charging effects? Simply, it's this very simple idea. I'm charging my sample with the incoming current. I'm sending a lot of uh, I, which stands for current in uh, electrical or physics in general. And then I'm releasing these uh, electrons, hopefully. They're leaving the system. 
and I'm trying to shorten the circuit to shorten down the circuit. So whatever doesn't leave will be hopefully shortened out, short circuit. But does it work all the time like that? No, because I won't have all the time conductive samples, right? In that case, I will be stuck with these samples, uh, these charges. And those charges will be some trap zones and they will be, uh, just simply put it, they will be playing with my final image. So I will be uh, deforming my final image. So you, my Mario image will be like, my pixels will be deformed, will be uh, giving information from unwanted locations. So this is a butterfly sample. And you see the charging effect explicitly here, the white areas, the, the very dark areas. Why is it happening? It's like, because it's not a conductive sample. How can you tackle this problem? One way is to coat your sample with a thin layer of metal, thin layer of gold, for example. That will hopefully get rid of the short circuit uh, effect. So a lot of those will not be trapped. Or another way is the following. If you work with a low energy of the beam, incoming electron beam, okay, there is a, a, a for every different material, of course, there is an uh, optimized uh, energy of the electrons, E2, where I will get uh, all the currents going to zero. So I don't need to short circuit this, okay? Like if you're working with Campton, great. Look at your lookup table. Work with 400 uh, electron volts, send electrons with this. Okay, so this is like a magical lookup table that allows you to work with still not so great uh, conductive materials, but still not trouble yourself with a lot of charging. What else can you do intelligently? And this is kind of a new trend that's coming up. It's called variable pressure. But having said that, there's another thing called, by the way, we don't need to work with 10 to the minus seven torque. There's a thing that I never work with myself, environmental SCM. Uh, but on top of it, I have this thing, and the environmental SCM is more like for the biology, uh, biology, natural environment analysis. But there's like the cells, those kind of things, I believe. But I never work with it, honestly, so I can't tell you more about it. But there's this variable pressure uh, methods where you also introduce some gas, like nitrogen, pure nitrogen into your chamber. Why? Well, you're charging up your sample with your incident beam, negatively charging, it needs to be compensated. How is it gonna be compensated? Well, if you have some gas inside your chamber like nitrogen, if this incoming electron, if, it, if, the, uh, if you can ionize this gas, ionize the nitrogen, the ionized nitrogen plus will be compensating this negative charge uh, loading of the sample so you can get away with your charging effect, okay? So that's what we call the variable pressure uh, SCM. So that's also taking off. So you can see the pressure ranges that we they're proposing nowadays. Our SCM is not like that. Our SCM is still a conventional 10 to the minus seven tor, a turbo pump uh, high vac SCM. And so that means we're really not close to anywhere like these. We're more in the uh, 10 to the minus three range or 10 to the minus two Pascal range, but they can go like to several millitors if you like to hear about it or tors or several uh, hundred Pascals easily. This is the chamber side. This is where the samples are. This is the gun column. Gun column has to be still very low pressure, 10 to the minus three Pascals. But inside the chamber, you're introducing nitrogen and certain gas to work to compensate for the charging effects. So you're increasing the pressure. Okay, so far so good. Now, uh, we have a problem. The problem is uh, this dilemma about the choice of the incoming energy. That's like a knob that I can work with. What am I talking about? The choice of the electron energy. If I uh, send my electrons with 30 kilo electron volts, you see the spot that I create, wonderful spots. The electrons are nicely situated close to each other. They're not interacting a lot. They're not diverged a lot, wonderful spot, even with lap six, a thermionic emission. Now, if I switch to one kilovolt, they're dispersed, terrible spot for me. It's not a blur, it's a blurry image. That's gonna create a blurry image. 
So that's this E0 number here. I need to make this as high as possible. And this is also true for the chromatic aberration too. If I make it higher, my look at this simple equation. If I make this higher, E0 higher, my DC, this uh, disk of least confusion that we were discussing in aberration, this will be converging to a single point because it's going to become zero, right? So that all works out great. I mean, if we think about it. So the remedy is work with a high energy electron, uh, any uh, electron energy. But then all of a sudden, this is happening. This is a real image that uh, can easily be extracted. Let's look at the energy values here. The one on the left is with captured with one kilo electron volt. The one on the right is captured with 20, sorry, 20 kilo electron volt. What does it mean? The 20 kilo electron volt, I told you that was gonna give me a better beam, right? A bit much better focus beam like this. And I wouldn't be traveling myself with all those non-idealities say coming from this disk of conf least confusion things, all the aberration problems. In contrast, that gives me worse quality of an image. And if I scan it from a, let's say an energy of 200 volts, see I'm increasing, it gets better. Like here, a good optimized two kilovolts. And then it gets started, starting from there, it gets really bad. All right, so this is what's happening. Let's just pause it here for a second. I just uploaded this little Java code for you. Uh, it's an electro Monte Carlo type of simulation. You can find it on our Canvas web page. You can run it with your students. It's very, very easy to play with. Maybe you already work with similar programs. So this is my input beam. It says 10 kilovolts. Okay, let's make it one kilovolt for a small energy. And then my target material, let's select aluminum. Okay, and then uh, I'm sending it into one kilovolt of uh, uh, electron to aluminum. Let's run this. What happened? So um, my beam just released some electrons here. I can't visualize them a lot because there's this one tiny one. Let's run it one more time. Let's select aluminum or maybe gold. Gold might be reliable. Let's make it one kilovolt. Okay, it's even smaller. So, and that's not surprising because gold has a high atomic number and this just generated with one kilovolt, the, all the electrons that are generated, the secondary electrons, the backscattered electrons, all the interaction is coming from here. And one division is 50 nanometers. You can run this with your students. This is 50 nanometers. This is 50 nanometers. So you see all of this uh, beam is coming from only this area, wonderful. Why? Because I call it wonderful because everything is related to this spot only. Now let's make it 100, a high energy beam. I'm exaggerating, of course. Okay, so now what, what happens if I didn't? It's still the same target, gold. Now what happened? Of course, because of the high energy beam, this is like kind of showing us how the trajectory has changed for the 100 electrons in coming into the, uh, with the beam, the green beam. And uh, these are the trajectories of the backscattered electrons, the blue trajectories. So you see that this is now 500 nanometers. It got expanded tremendously. It got into the structure, but also it got backscattered. And it's creating a lot of uh, sample interaction from all this volume. So you see, I'm not only localizing my beam to here and my information that I will extract only to here, like this case, but I'm getting like from all this area. What it means is my pixel size will be very blurry. It will capture because each one of these 500 nanometer, of course, nobody would work with uh, this kind of a 100 kilo electron volt in SCM easily. That's more about uh, transmission electron microscopy like we will cover. And you can see how why it's called transmission electron microscopy because we're almost uh, starting to transmit through the gold if you have a thin gold, let's say only a few hundred nanometers, it would be finding itself to the other side, right? 
So that's great uh, to see how the energy can be crucial. So creating the best beam requires me to work with a high energy, but creating the best image tells me to work with the smallest energy if possible. I mean, not the smallest, smallest one, but the, the certain energy that will not be as high as let's say these kind of energies. So these are in dilemma because I'm getting a lot of information from here. My pixel is blurred out, it's all smoothed. I'd like to also show you one more thing. Let's compare that with aluminum. Uh, so if I send this to aluminum, what's gonna happen? Since aluminum has low atomic number, now these all these little squares are 500 nanometer. It got into the depths of the aluminum and I've got a lot of <laughs> coming from all this area here. So low atomic number will be not able to stop the incoming beam as you might immediately, of course, without even running this uh, expect. Uh, but the backscattered electrons coefficient is small, like you can see here, 6% to 52%. The gold was efficiently backscattering. That's what we were saying, right? We would have more energy coming from the gold because it has higher atomic number, so it's able to reflect the electron more efficiently in contrast to aluminum. Aluminum kind of short circuits these, most of these that are not able to uh, extract themselves out as in the form of backscattered electrons. Anyways, you can play with this if you like, but if we continue, now this is what we also saw. The high kilo electron volt is great for the optics, but it works terrible for my image because I'm getting the whole pixel from everywhere. It's not great. So I have to work with a low KAV if possible, low energy. So lower beam energy means I will be getting a better picture. How can I work with both of these? Because I have to also think about the following. If I have low energy on the other side, my detection efficiency will be bad because I have low energy in the first place. I'm hitting the sample with low energy my extracted electrons will be low energy. Everything is going to be lower energy relatively. So less and less electrons will be detected at the other side. So this is covering all that detection sensitivity problem. This is a brilliant solution. Uh, and this is kind of also a new kind of emerging thing that's also lacking in our system here. We can work around this. We can make the beam still with high energy. So still, Create your beam with high energy, send uh, high energy, 10 kilo electron volt, 20 kilo electron volt, maybe 20 is large, but 10 kilo electron volt. Then do the following uh, apply negative voltage to your stage, your specimen. Okay. So, what does that mean? Create a DS, uh, deceleration field. So, the electron with high energy that's done its job optically, done good, uh, everything got, uh, has been nicely checked. Uh, check the boxes in the column. Now I have to land on the sample with low energy. Now start decelerating the electron with the intelligent way of putting your bias voltage. So the electron while it's landing, it's gonna do job, so it's gonna slow down. So once it hits, it's gonna be low energy. Now you have done both side of the things that you were aiming for. You landed with low energy, you created your beam with high energy. And it's also good for the detection because once the electrons are sent, released from this spot, since your detector has plus sign, uh, plus voltage, the electrons will be going more enthusiastically to the detector. So your detection uh, also efficiency is enhanced. And this is a simulation result. So the detected electrons, look at the, all the electrons that are not able to go back to the detectors, the backscattered electron detector that is immediately like a ping pong ball immediately here at 90 degrees. The inlands is here, they're not going in. But if you have that nice arrangement uh, with the right configuration of the biasing, then you can guide the electrons back, that's great. Okay, so we covered the secondary electrons and the backscattered electrons. If you remember, I touched briefly about the X-ray. What is this whole X-ray about? So in the sample, you have the atom, right? So if you knock off those elect part, uh, electrons from the orbit, that's what we said about the secondary electron, is this atom gonna just stay as it is? No, thermodynamically, it's gonna try to 
uh, lower down its energy, right? So this, this hole, this vacancy should be filled. How is it gonna be filled? With the higher uh, shell electron. So this electron will come down and land on this lower orbital. But this is like coming down the stairs. So this was higher energy, this is now lower energy. The universe has to compensate this energy. So it will release the uh, extensive amount of energy in terms of uh, X-rays. So this energy that will compensate this change will be released in terms of X-rays. This X-ray can always be released when electron and the uh, nucleus is in interaction. So there's always, in, uh, that's the continuous uh, X-ray emission, Bremsstrahlung. This is not really very important for us. This is the characteristic X-ray that we want. Why? Because look at it. The, this is going to release only that amount of energy that has the uh, difference between the energy levels of, say, the K and the L. These are the, sh uh, the shells, the orbits, the energies of the electrons that were acquired or, uh, prior to this interaction. So this has information shortly about my sample. So, yes, I can do some forensic. I can do now not just say, oh, bottom is gold, uh, bottom is silicon. Uh, and in other words, like in the case of backscattered electrons, I can't just say uh, this is like high atomic number, this is low atomic number. I can now say this is gold, this is silicon. I can figure out what everything is made out of. I can even like do these kind of quantitative results and I can figure out, okay, so I was trying to grow silicon nanowires with gold cap. So I was only expecting like silicon and gold, but where did this oxygen come from? There's quite a bit of oxygen peak, right? So that is contamination. I can figure that out. And I, if I need to uh, recreate uh, my nanowires, I can figure that out. So this is a typical X-ray, energy dispersive X-ray uh, spectroscopy result coming from different peaks. These are characteristic beams. If we look at the log scale, that continuous X-ray emission that I was telling you, the troublesome emission, Bremsstrahlung, is this one here. We're not really concerned about that. That's something that the tool has to isolate, that has to get rid of that. We need to deal with these characteristic X-rays to understand what we're looking at. But, but it's not easy because, like, say, this titanium and barium, they all uh, have like these overlapping peaks, like you can see, it's not easy to analyze. So, and then the other thing is, you can't just say I get this many of uh, X-ray emission from the sample corresponding to these peaks. So my concentration is immediately that. I can't do this kind of a conversion because like we just seen in the Monte Carlo simulation we, we did before, once we send the electron, the, uh, the emission, the X-ray emission is coming from this whole area. And see, it's really coming from the depth, uh, more than the secondary electron and the backscattered electron. This is like one micron range. This whole thing is coming from the micrometer range. And there's really like high intensity areas where the X-ray is like created a lot. And this sample is some iron uh, variant. And so I can get iron X-rays silicon and oxygen x-rays at the same time. Let's say I get my iron x-ray or the oxygen x-ray at the same point. Which one will be going out more efficiently? Of course, the iron x-ray will be going out more efficiently. It's, trans it's much more energetic, so it will go out, whereas the oxygen will get stuck. So I will artificially think that I have more iron than oxygen, but that's going to be false. It's not the case. Another problem that I can encounter is that once I excite these iron X-rays, these iron X-rays can also fluoresce the silicon X-ray or oxygen X-ray since it has higher energy, so it can interact and then uh, release artificial X-rays from the other one. So that's another problem too. So if you have the higher uh, X-ray that you can obtain, they will uh, be able to release the other ones. This is how we do the detection of the X-ray emission with a silicon lithium based detection mechanism with a cryostat. Not a huge deal. We have like a beryllium uh, filter at the entrance. Uh, when the X-ray is coming in, it's like a photodetector. You can think of it that way. 
a simple photodetector, like a sensor kind of thing, just counts for the coming X-ray, since X-ray is kind of also like in the form of a light. All right, now, great. We have seen that we can now fingerprint the material. Can we do even better? Yes, the answer is electron probe microanalysis, EPMA. And this is the tool, that's how it's, the schematic is laid out. Well, it looks almost like our scanning electron microscope, right? We have the electron source, I will show you one more. We have the lenses, we have like the scan coils, almost identical. So yes, it's uh, very similar. The one important thing is the beam, the final beam, we're not really aiming for immediate resolution here. The beam is larger. We're aiming for something more. This is called WDS, wavelength dispersive. So instead of the energy dispersive spectroscopy with the X-ray, remember, now we're going to do uh, wavelength dispersive uh, methods. And this is how it works. Now, comparing the two methods that I just showed you, this is the classical X-ray detection. Okay, so we hit the beam with the electrons, X-rays are emitted, and we collect those X-rays. And we try to figure out what the material is made out of. Now, if we don't immediately collect those X-rays, but if we put a crystal here, that will filter out the information for me and will give me more information about the surface, uh, the, uh, the sample itself. This crystal is going to be very carefully chosen. And if this is the crystal that I have in hand, this is my where the X-ray emission is going to hit. Let's say these are the atoms that are waiting for me. If I know this, these spacing uh, between the atoms of this crystal, uh, the material that I, I put, this is the analyzing crystal. I know what, it's, uh, what it is very, very well. And if I look for from the specimen at a certain angle, this theta angle is also very well known. There is this simple equation that has to do with the uh, con constructive interference mechanism. It's just like uh, simple waves, wave interference, like the ocean waves. It's this kind of the same wave interference over and over again. If anyone has an issue or would like to um, get a derivation of this, I can talk more about it in the office hour. It's very simple. I'm sure many of you already know about it, the Brax famous equation. but when this happens, the diffracted X-ray, and only that diffracted X-ray, that will come from the right material will survive. So this equation will hold like a biblical figure. So if I know this D distance, if I know the theta angle, then I will know the lambda, the wavelength of the X-ray. And that wavelength of the X-ray will be particular to the sample's X-ray emission, whatever the material is made out of there. So. The uh, energy dispersive um, spectroscopy gave me those kind of large uh, peaks. You remember the uh, almost overlapping peaks? I wasn't able to make out of what, what the material was made out of. Like selenium and germanium are like kind of overlapping. I, do, I, I overeat the germanium. I, I may not able to find out germanium in the previous X-ray detection mechanism now. Thanks to this rack, it's kind of working like a filter. So it's kind of making this broad uh, uh, emission and only like filtering out it and pinpointing the, the uh, right wavelength, which is corresponding to the right material and saying it, there's arsenic here. And I can pick up contamination now. Look, I can even pick up very, very small amount traces of contamination from the sample. And I can say, oh, yeah, you have arsenic contamination. Not just what the sample is made out of, but you, if you have something that you don't expect to see, then you can see those little peaks. And this is something that was examined here at Penn State in the Millennium Science Complex. They had these two, I believe, batteries or something like that made out of, uh, like, covered with sulfur and uh, molybdenum, like you can see. But these are very like overlapping with each other, like you can see. In the case of a uh, previous case, you would never be able to see which one is which, okay? They of course have a different optical reflection. This one is more reflective, so uh, on the right. So it's probably made out of molybdenum as a metal, but still you can't immediately say it with the energy dispersive analysis. Now with the EPMA, you can do that. You can do crazy things. In the whole haystack, 
you can look for some specific combination of like zirconium, boron, uh, hafnium, and carbon. And you can say, okay, here it is. I get this whole thing in here. And that's going to correspond to some certain boundary. So you can find the atoms at the right spot at the uh, location that you want with the EPMA. And you can do even more crazier things like this. You can scan the whole surface and do some quantitative analysis, not just qualitative analysis, and say, okay, in this uh, range, uh, I have a very homogeneous material. Look, in the horizontal direction, I have oxygen, like say 16%. In the vertical, it's also 16%. And if I look at my material in the horizontal and vertical, my indium to lead concentration is like identical. So yes, I have done a great job by creating this material. So it's a great element analysis uh, for especially material science. You can like understand what your material is made out of, but it's like this kind of a consistency too. And you can get like these kind of phase uh, sample, phase ID, IDing, like BSC only gives you this. But you can fingerprint nickel, iron, uh, all these copper, etc. You can extract what everywhere is located with what kind of material. So uh, you can get stoichiometry, you can get uh, elemental analysis, you can get phases like we've see, just seen for the case of bronze. So this was bronze, by the way, made out of all these. Uh, that's wonderful. Over EDS, energy dispersive spectroscopy, that works wonderful. Now, the last thing that I'm going to uh, touch, and then we're going to do the demo together with you guys, is the electron backscatter diffraction. So I'm going to send my beam again to the sample. And the idea is at some singular point, my beam will create some uh, electrons, right? Will be uh, diffracting the elect or say generate the electron. And if I look at my instead of a single atom here that it will uh, interact with, if I look at from different views, different angles, my atom organization in my crystal, say iron, uh, for example, in at different uh, angles of uh, perception. If I put this whole uh, iron crystal uh, in a crystal uh, symmetry, and if I send my electron again, if created like these other electrons, and those are going to generate more electrons, like we've seen more secondary electrons, all these interaction, all this thing is again going to be conditioned with BRAC diffraction. And this BRAC diffraction, if I put like say thousands of electrons together, uh, so, so thousands of atoms together, okay, and if I look at iron from this angle, what do I see? I hope you can, I can convince you. I can clearly see this. This is a periodic arrangement. I can clearly see this line too. I can see this, this line at this angle too. And the same thing is also persistently coming in. These are the Kikuchi lines that I can draw and simulate with thousands of uh, atoms combined together and they will give me this. These are kind of give me the idea about the diffraction pattern that I can get from the sample. Why are they going to be important? I'll, share that with you in a minute. So if you can simulate and you can try to extract the diffraction pattern that you will get from your sample at say some lower energy and lower energy doesn't work great. So because they will be broadened, your diffraction uh, lines will be broadened. So instead of a singular line like this, you will get broad lines. But if you increase your incoming energy of your electron that's gonna interact with your sample, now you can converge that to more like the Kikuchi theoretical lines out, so, uh, out of your simulations, but these are extensive simulations. I've, I've not run them, so uh, they're from the literature. And so uh, in the end, so you can get some crystallographic information with respect to say uh, these two. Uh, iron uh, in, the, in this kind of a format uh, from this angle, uh, with this kind of a crystallography uh, where the atoms are located in the, uh, I mean, uh, austenite, I'm sorry, the, uh, I should say it for, uh, in a precise way, in a ferrite. So in this kind of a, a atomic arrangement, these are more material science, a little bit 
outside of my comfort zone. This is why I'm kind of not able to pronounce them great. But you see, all in all, they give me these kind of diffraction patterns while I'm looking at them with different angles. While I'm turning the sample at every face, all these different diffraction patterns will be generated. If I have a computer, say, this can also overlap with my intentions of the artificial intelligence, all those uh, extensive computational power. If I send my instant beam at a certain angle, get the information out at the end and then put that on a detector, I can extract the, these diffraction patterns, hopefully, like this. And why am I putting it at a uh, certain angle? To extract more electrons. When I have an angle, that will be more efficient for me to get these uh, Bragg diffractions. I can get these kind of color-coded uh, uh, boundaries of the uh, my grain sizes, like my uh, uh, polycrystalline materials, different crystallography can be understood. And also, let me see, I, uh, yeah, there you go. The ferrite and the austenantite can be obtained from these different locations based on these different diffraction uh, lines that I will extract. Generally, these samples are nicely polished. So this is a little bit of a different uh, extreme example. But in the end, this is a great way to get, like, say, uh, crystallographic information as well as texture. Because wherever you send it, in which different phase where we interact with the sample, uh, we will extract different information. And then we can extract phase information, too. So this is all thanks to this kind of a simple arrangement of the incoming beam with the the sample and the detection. So, yes, uh, I don't want to imply that uh, it's a deep analysis. It's still from the very surface of the sample, um, not a very extended, extended depth. And you might ask, why are we bothering with this? Because we have like a better, maybe a tool with the TEM diffraction. Yes, there is that too, but this is also an emerging thing coming up. And it gives you like these kind of, uh, 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 grain boundary, like you can see here, it's like a tomographical information that I call it like that. But still, as I was saying, this is not like the whole depth of the sample too. So thank you very much for your patience. Now uh, we're going to start the, um, the scanning electron microscopy, uh, go back to the scanning electron microscopy and start the, 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 the demo together. And before doing that, I will just introduce very quickly this website, MyScope Training, because it's a very useful website. If you go in there and you can do this with your students, we gave you the link. If you click scanning electron microscopy, if you haven't so far, and click SEM simulator, this enables you to simulate an SEM from your own uh, class. You can do the things in sequence. It will guide you, don't worry. You can't break anything easily. Well, I guess it allows you to break things just for you to learn. Like you can close the, sam uh, uh, the chamber, you can put your samples inside, and then uh, you can uh, pump down the system. And then uh, you can choose the, the sample, let's say wood to work with, and then uh, select the acceleration voltage that you were talking about, 10 kilovolts. Uh, and uh, then the... Right, so HD, we, we, start to, we start the acceleration, we're releasing the electrons, and then we can do some focusing, for example. So I'll just do very briefly, we'll do the real deal in a second. I hope the internet will work on that computer, but you see I'm doing a little bit of focusing, and that kind of a focusing is interacting with the electromagnetic lenses, and then it's a little bit difficult to control with your mouse, but this is giving me a real good, uh, understanding, especially for my students, um, a good hands-on experience uh, that we carried out in the last summer due to COVID, so we didn't have access to this lab. But you you also can do like backscattered electron too, not just secondary electron, you can do backscattered electron. Of course, you have to choose a re uh, reasonable sample, not wood sample, but like a, 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 a something to work with in terms of composition. So uh, what we're seeing here is a butterfly sample. It's a non-conductive sample, of course. So we coated that with a little bit thin of gold layer initially. 
And this is a sample that we carried out research together with the students uh, from California uh, with our partners. So what I'm doing here is just like optical microscope. Okay, let me go back. So I'm playing with my magnification and focusing now, just like optical microscope. What would you do? The first thing that you do in, when you sit in front of an optical microscope, you go to the lowest magnification and that's what I'm doing. Look at the, the bar, scale bar here, 100 micrometers and magnification also is a good guy here, guide here 84 times. So I'm gonna increase the magnification just like the optical microscope. While we're increasing the magnification, what are we changing? I hope you remember, we're now uh, assigning a smaller area to scan, right? And that was done by raster coils. So we, the raster coils helped me to scan a smaller area. Now I have to switch to a bigger lens or a more or a stronger lens. Why? Because I have to magnify more, right? So in this case, I don't have a physical way of changing the, uh, the lenses, of course. I will do this electromagnetically with uh, applying different currents to the uh, electromagnetic lenses. So I will be playing with the focusing knob. And as I'm playing with the focusing knob, you see the change. What am I doing? I'm sending different current to the, the coil that I have here. And let me change the fine focusing. It's again, very similar to the optical microscope from coarse focusing to fine focusing. Now I'm just like to go to this area here and I'm magnifying more because I, I'm now in the right lens, if you like to think of it that way, or in the right focusing. So about the working distance, working distance, remember that was the distance between the physical distance between the sample and the objective lens. That is now 7.1 millimeter. At this working distance, it means, by the way, let me show you the whole thing, switching back to the TV mode. And this is my gun column here. These are my samples, the stage. And this is the physical distance that we're talking about. Of course, like not exactly because I have the thickness of the sample, right? Where I focus my sample of my beam. Uh, so it has to take into consideration that. And this is the, the pressure that we're talking about. The gun column is at four times 10 to the minus 10 torres. If you like to do a simple comparison with the pressure inside our rooms, which is like, let's round it 760 to 1000. So that's 10 to the three. And we're looking at 10 to the minus 10. So that's like a factor of a compression factor of 10 to the 13. It's a lot, but it needs that to be able to make sure that you will not have arcs. Uh, it can create arcs under the, you know, electron creation, electron emission. So let's go back to the in-lens detection, like we were saying. So remember the detector types, in-lens detector is the detector that we're using. SE2 st uh, stands for the Everhard Thornley. That's the detector outside in the chamber that has a lower resolution. Let's sit, switch to that. You see the image got quality wise worse because I'm now picking up a lot of other kind of creational uh, electrons at the same time. I have the energy uh, selective backscattered, but I'm not sure if this is working in our tool. And we have a great story about our backscattered uh, detection uh, because I would like you guys also, I mean, probably, you know, but um, uh, the back, these are expensive, very expensive tools, right? So, and this is how it's oriented. Now, the story is, unfortunately, there was a hit, there was a crash and the tool that I showed you, the online tool allows you to play with that. If you keep the working distance to be very small, right? You have a chance with the bulky samples to touch the, uh, the gun column, which will put the backscattered diffraction, um, uh, uh, backscattered uh, detector into jeopardy because that's the ping ball, ping pong ball that's the one that's going to immediately collect electrons, if you remember. And that's the one that's uh, unfortunately uh, destroyed in our case. And each one of these are like thousands of dollars, unfortunately. So let's go back to our in-lens. Remember, in-lens is really inside the lens and gives me the best resolution because it's under the influence of some ele external electromagnetic field. So I'm magnifying. And at the same time, I'm refocusing to get the best image. Now we'll complete this and it will be two o'clock and uh, I'll be 
uh, expecting your questions, or you can even ask them at the same time if you have any, because I'm not able to look at the chat window right now. Now, what are we seeing? But I will be very happy to also answer more during the office hour too. Uh, so while I'm focusing, uh, sorry, while I'm magnifying, I'm trying to refocus too. But at some point, I can't gain much. So at this point, I have these stigmators. Remember the aberration problems? Then the aberration problems will be circumvented with these stigmators. So I'm working with these stigmators to counteract the aberration problem. So don't get me wrong. It's not ex exactly like the optical microscope. It's similar, but there are other things, of course, that one needs to pay attention to. All right, so as good as it gets kind of in this quick imaging so i think there's like a some features that we're missing here so i'm playing with the stigmator there we go yep all right now there are apertures that we were talking about now let's look if we have a good alignment aperture alignment i'm hitting the wobbling button to see if i have a good aperture alignment what do i see i see that my image gets shifted in this uh cross-sectional uh, uh, diagonal phase. What it means is my aperture is unfortunately not aligned. So while I'm defocusing and focusing back, my image is not stable. So, I mean, for a good uh, like paper quality imaging, I would have to work with this image and have to counteract that uh, imaging aperture problem aperture should be aligned so that I would be having a nice stable uh, information. So this is the butterfly and you see where we came to, this is now 47, 50 times and we can really go to 1 million easily, uh, sorry, not 1 million, but 1,000, 100,000 very easily. We can easily like, uh, let me say, maybe not super easily, but uh, it, it try to extend it to uh, uh, several hundred thousand, say 200,000, 300,000. That's kind of the bar. The reason is we are on the third floor. If you like to put your SEM, your scanning electron microscope, which is going to be a quite a sensitive measurement, right? You'd like to place it in the basement. But this tool is now, on, unfortunately, uh, in the third floor. We've done an anti vibration table under it. So to minimize the vibration. So let me switch to gold nanoparticles with the folks who have some additional time. It's now two o'clock as I see, but let's look at it very quickly. I will try to show you the effect of this uh, vibrations. So this is a gold nanoparticle sample synthesized by our students. It's in the colloidal form. So they put a little one droplet on the surface. And once the droplets just got vaporized, we can introduce water into this chamber, of course. Uh, we put them inside the chamber, but then you, you're left with the coffee stain, and that coffee stain is actually the creates the the area, the zone where I should be looking for my uh, nanoparticles. So let's look. All right, trying to work with my magnification. I'm hoping you're able to follow up with the from the this uh, scale bar here. Anyways, let's dive in. So I can see some micron structures. I ask my students, are these the micro nano uh, particles that I'm looking for? No, because now these will be probably, but the larger structures, once I focus, they will be, they can, e can easily be measured and we can easily figure out that they're not the particles. They're not the size, right size of particles we're looking for. Right, so now things are starting to get uh, much brighter. So let's go in and dive in. So these are the ones, these are the crystals. Uh, yes, the Rene will be sending you the survey. We'll be very happy to get your feedback. So these are the larger crystal structures coming from the colloidal formation. But now these are the little particles that I'm after. So let's dive in. And as I magnify, I lose the focus. I try to refocus, but there's a lag. So that makes it a little bit difficult for me too because of the zoom, I guess. 
at least it's fair to everyone. So I'm seeing what kind of a lack everyone is uh, experiencing. Now I have to, I can't focus anymore. So what should I do? I told you I need to work with my stigmation uh, to see if I can gain a little bit more from this. By the way, I didn't tell you, but uh, probably you've seen we're accelerating at the voltage of five kilo electron volt. So that's our uh, potential that we work with here. Yes, these are going to be the little uh, gold nanoparticles. If I manage to get a uh, kind of a better image, it will be a little bit hard with the, the lag, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would be able to show you very clearly the, the boundaries will tell you the vibration problem. So let's see if we can still. By the way, we're now at almost 500,000. So that's a huge magnification. Let's do it this way just to make sure uh, I will be able to show it to everyone, share with it to everyone, share it with everyone. So I'll show you a picture that I had captured earlier without the legs. So where is it? The gold nano butter, uh, the gold nano particles. Uh, if I have a bigger picture, that would be even better. But now, yeah, we can even work with this. So you can, there are like these kind of features that you can use, say, like point to point measure. So once you capture these images, like these software will enable you to get like these 27, 30 nanometer in that range. That's the nanoparticle size. And if I have a, even a smaller one, so this is another research that I carried out with my students here, but uh, two summers ago, two students synthesized different size of nanoparticles that you can see here. They're coming in every different size, but these are really good. So I can immediately show you the, all right. So this was an image taken on a good day. And I hope you can see that there's some blurriness at the edge. So that's all that has to do with the resolution. And this tool is like said to be in one nanometer resolution uh, when the uh, when there are like certain, of course, recipes are followed, but also you put your uh, scanning electron microscope in the basement. Now, since we have some vibration coming in, there's this blurriness. And once I look in and dive in there, I found out that that blurriness is extending up to five nanometers. So that means that even the tool can do really like uh, at its best day uh, with the recipe, one nanometer resolution, the place that you locate the tool and all those other variables are also a huge key factor. So you will be deviating, you will be degraded in terms of your resolution. All right, so I believe that's kind of about it.